seminar of our BQE series. It is. Okay. And um, so um, I'm, uh, we're located in Brooklyn, but our speaker will actually be speaking from London. So we're taking advantage of the uh, new time slot that we have. And um, here in Brooklyn, we just got more snow. <laughs> our third major snowfall in the last uh, three weeks or so. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I just finished shoveling. So, um, so our speaker has is, is kindly um, agreed to allow questions uh, at any point during this talk. So feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. Let me um, read you his bio. So um, Tom Davis, um, PhD, is a vice president and Director of Research Fixed Income and Derivatives at FactSet. So in this role, he's focused on ensuring FactSet provides the highest quality fixed income and derivative analytics while growing the coverage across all asset classes. His team also conducts cutting edge research in the models and methods of quantitative finance, which will ultimately increase the speed and accuracy of FactSet analytics. Prior to FactSet, Mr. Davis spent four years at Numerics as Vice President of Product Management in charge of the flagship product. And before that, four years managing a team of quantitative analysts at FinCAD focused on arbitrage fee models of interest rates and, and FX rates used to price exotic hybrid derivatives. Dr. Davis is a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and grew up in Oakville, uh, just a few miles away from where I grew up. So Tom, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me to talk. It's a real honor and pleasure to talk to NYU. Um, I'm going to be talking about some research I've done recently on the likelihood ratio method, which is a well-known method, but I think the applicability uh, is broader than may maybe is known in the industry. Um, and this, all, all of these uh, research results stem from a paper that was just recently accepted to the Journal of Derivatives called Evergreen Trees. Uh, and it's where I give an alternative derivation of the binomial trinomial trees and apply the likelihood ratio method on those to get uh, efficient and accurate Greeks. Um, so this talk, um, as I said, it's a well-known method started in uh, Monte Carlo. You can read about it in Glassman's book or a lot of uh, papers talk about uh, the likelihood ratio method. Um, but we can also apply it to binomial trees, trinomial trees, partial differential equations, and Monte Carlo in a different sense um, than has been applied to in the past. Um, one of the things that we gain from this is on binomial and trinomial trees, we can calculate gamma. Um, it's well known that due to interactions with the payoff and the node structure of the trees, gamma cannot be calculated on a, trino, on a binomial tree, including through techniques like automatic differentiation. But once we have the likelihood ratio method delta, we can combine that with automatic differentiation and we can get uh, a gamma on a tree. So I'll go through those results. Um, that, that, the results I just said, uh, the gamma and the, the title of the talk, a likely gamma, come from a paper I just submitted to Risk Magazine. Um, it's at the second round of referees now. Um, and that's on SSRN, and I have a link to it in the conclusions. Um, but what I talk about next is not written down or submitted anywhere. These are preliminary results for uh, um, least squared American Monte Carlo and PDE methods uh, combined with the likelihood ratio method. So in the evergreen tree paper, I rederive or provide an alternative derivation for binomial and trinomial trees, which are most often said come from an explicit PDE method. And I say, uh, I provide an alternative viewpoint that, that derives them from a Green's function uh, point of view. So to talk about that, we'll start with the, the Feynman-Katz theorem, which is, I think is one very fundamental theorem in quant finance, since it relates the discounted value of future cash flow expectations to the solution of, par of a partial differential equation, where the coefficients in the PDE come from the stochastic differential equation, whatever, however you want to model your market observable. So for instance, if X was a stock price, the SDE was log normal, you would get the Black-Scholes equation, and given the max of X, S minus K, you'd get the Black-Scholes uh, equation, a uh, closed form solution. But what if I wanted to do something a bit more general? I just didn't want to solve it in a special case of say, um, uh, one specific payoff function, but I wanted to be more general. One thing I could do is calculate the arrow Debrew security price, which is the solution of this PDE with a very specific boundary condition in that the stock price of the market observable is exactly equal to one precise value Z, say 101.25. Of course, it's very unlikely it's going to hit that value. So we need to basically get the per parameterized um, arrow Debrew security price for all values of Z. 
Now this error debris security price gives you the present value of $1 in the specific state of the world where that stock is exactly equal to that Z. From this, you can do a, a, essentially a convolution integral. It's not technically a convolution, but I'll call it that for the purposes of this talk. It's with the um, boundary, any, any payoff function, F, and you get the solution of the, um, uh, the, the option price, the contingent claim. So this is how you can go from, say, uh, Black-Scholes equation, get your digital binary, whatever sort of payoff function you want, because we know the arrow debris security price. Now, if the arrow debris, sorry, if the rates are interest rates are deterministic, the PDE separates. Technically, it's called separation of variables, and in that case, the arrow debris security price factors into well-known discounting in exp exponential of the integral of the interest rates. Um, and the transition probability density G, which I'll be calling Green's function um, for, for the rest of this talk. So this equation at the bottom, you know, is sort of almost like an axiom of quant finance. It's written down. You discount, you have the, the end payoff, you multiply the probability transition density and you integrate. It's sort of obviously true that this is true, but it's nice to see it does come from somewhere a bit more fundamental in the Feynman Katz theorem. Uh, now, if you want to solve integrals or problems uh, with a computer, you have to dissertize both state uh, and time. So the stock price and time, say. In order to discretize time, we notice that we don't actually have to integrate, take from the um, maturity to today. We can go halfway, and then we can go halfway again. This is analogous to saying, I can discount from a year to six months, and then six months today, and I get the discounting from the whole, the whole time period. Um, how you do that in a stochastic case is a bit more complicated, which we'll see next slide, but in principle, I could do the expectation halfway and then do the, again that in integral convolution, and you see that written down in integral form in the middle of the slide. Um, you can think of this as like transporting the price. So I know the cash flows in the future, I transport it to six months from now, I transport it to today, and I, I have the uncertain cash flows um, uh, as the solution of the price of the contingent claim. Um, what's, what's kind of interesting, and I don't know if it's widely appreciated, is that this means that if you take the Black-Scholes equation, multiply it by the Green's function, and do the integral, you get the Black-Scholes equation again. This is a symmetry operation of the Black-Scholes equation. Uh, and if you stare at the, the middle equation long enough, and you compare it to the earlier equation at the bottom of the slide here, we see one Green's hey, function. Yep. Yeah. I just, could you actually go back to that slide, the one you just had up? This one, um, I actually think where you wrote the PD separates is is not where you, what you meant. Um, so I agree, separation of variables is a well known concept for partial differential equations, and I think we can both agree that what it means is the PD has a structure such that you can reduce it to um, an ordinary differential equation. If it was a, it was originally in two variables, like it is here reduce it to an ordinary differential equation in time and another ordinary differential equation in space. But that's not what you're actually trying to capture as a thought when you say you know, rates are deterministic. Um, what you're actually trying to do is say that the arrow de Bru security price you know, factors or so, um, which is a different statement is all I'm saying. Um, so um, like you're trying to split up you know, discounting from expectation. Okay, fine. But and separation of variables in the PDE context is separating time from space. Okay, so two different separations. Is that clear? So if you write in this equation, the PDE at the bottom here, if you write C equals G, uh, C equals D times G, let's say, yeah, you get you get an equation for G and you get an equation for C. I agree. And what's the equation for the type of equation for um, for like what I'm saying is you'll get a PDE still right like you'll you'll turn yeah. this current PDE into another PDE but two, that's not what two. separation of variables is or two of them fine but I was taught separation of variables takes a PDE and turns it into two ODEs ordinary differential equations do you see the point yeah. Um... So like, when I was when I was taught this, it was in a physics contest, and you would separate, say, the radial variable from the the spherical variable from the yeah, that's fine. angle variable. Yeah, I, I, we I were told like, that that was separation of variables. Yeah, and it is, 
well, my main point is like I agree you can get rid of the right hand side here that says right. you, you send it to zero, right? Right, yes, exactly. We're in sync on that. I agree you can do it. I'm I just calling it the wrong thing. Separation of variables for PDEs is a terminology thing. Okay. Separation of variables for PDEs, if you go look it up, it it will separate X from T here as opposed to you know make the right hand side zero. Okay. Okay. Fair. The terminology. All right. <laughs> sure. go ahead. Um, okay, so if we stare at this middle equation now and compare it to the equation at the bottom, we see that there's one Green's function versus two Green's function, and there's an extra integral over the intermediate variable x1. Now, this means that the Green's function can be written as that product, if you will, and this is the analog of the discounting going from um, one year to six months to today for a stochastic process. If the process is Markov, it obeys this equation called the chapman kolmogorov equation. So it says that the transition probability density from going from X to Z can be split up <clears throat> into an intermediate time tau, as long as you integrate over all possible realizations of the uh, market observable, you get back the Green's function. Um, now, why would you want to do this? Well, the one, application I'm talking about here is splitting, uh, is discretizing time, but you also have to do this because the price process is non-Markov, i.e. there's a path dependence or there's an early exercise. You need to make sure that you have your computer computing the values of the price on that time and then manipulating them, like doing the continuation value or zero or, or continuation value or exercise value. So if your price profit is non-Markov, you have to discretize the integral into the points at which it's uh, early exercise is allowed. So this has a couple of, of applications. So if you do this a number of times, say a large number of n times, you end up with the path integral formalism of quant finance, which Capriati has done a lot of work. And I think uh, Roger Lee has also done some work on. Um, so this is the jumping starting off point in my evergreen paper tree for deriving the binomial and trinomial tree. But in this talk, since we're only talking about gammas and deltas, um, I just need one application of the chapman kolmogorov to discretize to a small time step T1. So now at the bottom, I've just gone a step further and called that integral of uh, over Z variable G1. So this G1 is uh, a valid contingent claim price or option price at the small time T1 ahead of uh, where we are today. And my claim is that, well, we'll get to it later, but it you have this, this um, equation, and it doesn't matter how you got G1, if you want to then do this integral back to today, it could be Monte Carlo, it could be PDEs, it could be uh, binomial trees or closed form even. Um, so fine, so we have a little time discretization. Now, if we want to discretize space or the market observable, we actually need to know a little bit more information about the process. So I'm gonna say, let's look at log normal. And one of the main future avenues of research is going beyond log normal, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the, uh, the, end of the talk. Um, so we know the Green's function exactly in the log normal case. If you can do this, you know almost everything about the process, you can get closed form solutions. This is why we can uh, have the Black-Scholes equation. Now, if you stare at it, you can, and that integral, you can transform that integral into something that's amenable in what's called Gauss-Hermite quadrature. So if you want to, um, do this integral, it's an infinite integral on a computer, you need to take a, a, a finite number of function evaluations to do it. That's precisely what any numerical quadrature technique gives you. But for uh, uh, equations of this form, of which the log normal can be transformed into this form, we have gauss hermite and second order gives you two function evaluations exactly um, with weights of actually one half and one half to get you um, the entire integral. So if we do that, we get an approximation of the price. So again, suppose G1 was Monte Carlo, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, generate an option price at time T1 based on Monte Carlo at two, at two, plot, uh, two spots, um, an upstate and a downstate, if you will, I'm borrowing terminology from term, a binomial tree here, then you can get the price today based on this gauss hermite quadrature method. Um, and then if you did this n times uh, and you discretize the number of time steps and you choose the time steps such as that the variance change between time steps is constant, you get a recombining tree and you get the formula in the middle for the price of an option. Now I claim this is the binomial tree, but you will say that uh, if you've read the CRR, Cox, Rubenstein, and Ross paper, it's not the probabilities and stock um, that you see in that paper, and that's right. But in 1997, Beninga and Wiener uh, prove that the limiting distribution is the same. 
And in the evergreen tree paper, I go, I, I, I actually do recalculate um, the probabilities from the CRR paper by using something called shifted Gauss for my quadrature. And if you're interested in that, we can talk about that, but that's in, in the appendix of the, uh, of the paper to appear in journal derivatives. Okay, so we have the setup we need. We've talked about how to discretize time. And for log normal processes, at least, we've talked about how to discretize space. So what does the likelihood ratio method have to do with this? Well, we can do the same thing. We start again with this convolution that uh, gives you the price today based on if you know the price function at, at time t1. And <clears throat> the, the trick of the likelihood ratio method is that we see that the initial variable only appears in the transition density function, in the Green's function. So therefore, taking the derivative of both sides on the left hand, on the right hand side, only acts on the Green's function. If you um, multiply and divide by the Green's function again, you have something that looks like an expectation value, but over a, a different quantity. So if we define that quantity h, let's say, um, it's, you're just looking at another expectation. And since we are able to calculate g1 using some machinery that we've built on the computer for, for precisely doing this, calculating expectation values, we just plug in a different value to take the expectation value of a dif different functional form, and we get delta. So that's the well-known likelihood ratio method. Um, but now with this, uh, let's see how we can go a bit further or find out something new using um, this technology of the uh, likelihood ratio method. So of the Green's function method. So we know, oh, there's, there's a mistake here. Anyway, I don't know if there's a mistake here. But we know in the log normal um, uh, case, the Green's function exactly. So we can by hand take the derivative of the Green's function. So then we have uh, a closed form solution for the delta of an option in a, in a log normal world. What if we just did the gauss harmonic quadrature again on this instead of what we originally had? Well, we get this. We get a delta that depends on the value of an option at the up state of the world and a down state of the world. So you know, plus uh, root v minus root v. <clears throat> and again, we don't know how G1 is calculated. So in this, in this talk, for the next um, couple of minutes, we're going to talk about binomial tree, Monte Carlo, and PDE for calculating G1 and see what we, can, what we can do to get the delta. On the binomial tree, it's the most exceptional, I would say. Um, so let's start hey, there. What's the, um, Tom, what's the significance of the subscript 1 on G? Um, it, like, uh, is it, yeah, why did you put a subscript 1 on little g? Um, is it because of first derivative? No, no, no. Uh, it has to do with here. Basically, when you when you discretize um, n times, let's say if you do the first integral with uh, from the boundary condition f of x n to f of x n minus one, let's call that g of n minus one. And then to get g of n minus two, you integrate from like time t n minus one to time t n minus two. So you're sort of stepping backwards in time. Let's call like gn f of n actually, but then gn minus one, the option price at the, the time interval before it, and, the and then gn minus two, the time interval before it. So then you get to g1 is the first time step after today. And so g0 would be the option price today. Okay, so little g1 means the, the price the option will have tomorrow? Exactly, yeah. Um, okay. Okay, that's fine. It's not on this page, right? Um, the little G one. No, but it is at the bottom. Not. Sorry, my best. Yeah, yeah, it's no, okay. it is at the bottom. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, now I understand what little G one is. Okay. Okay. Can you so, see what I'm sharing now, or do you still see that? Yeah. Can you see your paper as opposed to your slides? Yes. Okay, it's in here. I, I talk about the iteration that gives you um, a background general framework, and so here. So successfully performing the integration, you go back from, this is uh, your maturity, and I'm only doing the first time step to get gn minus one, and then basically this is an iteration. And once you start discretizing the stock price here, you get the binomial tree. That's how it comes out of this formalism. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, thank you for answering my question. So, <clears throat> So G1 is the price of an option tomorrow at the first time step. And we have, oh yeah, so we have 
this formula that if we know it only at two discrete points, I can get uh, the value of a delta. So on the binomial tree, you've already calculated that. You have, you've gone from maturity, you go backwards and you calculate at each time point, the value of the option on each node. So you have G1 already calculated. Now, technically, technically you don't have it at, on, on most implementations, uh, including this sort of stochastic drift term or the, the drift term, you only have it at plus and minus Delta V. So that's where the shifted Gauss Hermite quadrature comes in. You have to shift the, the node points a little bit. And you have to be very careful that you don't ruin the error structure or the structure of the Gauss. Yeah, just comment um, on this, in this approximation, the, the right-hand side could be negative, right? Uh, yeah, well, something positive that you're multiplying by. So if the something positive is bigger than one, then the whole result is negative. I mean, G1 minus G1 might be negative, like for a put that's negative. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, okay, I agree. But let's say C is a call. So, um, you know, so the, you're trying to get the delta of a call. And, I'm thinking that this approximation, and it is an approximation, could be negative. Yeah. Okay, which is, you know, just a, it's in the nature of approximation. It's not necessarily, you know, getting the right sign. Right. You, you mean just you, based on this, just based on this term? Yes, just based on that term. So this is the integral of the rate over t to t1. So that's probably small. This is... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I'm just saying it could be. I'm not saying it would. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I mean, it's squared. So this, it doesn't matter if this whole thing is negative. You're talking about if this thing is greater than the square, uh, greater than one. Yes, yeah. I am. So I guess that puts a, a very coarse um, bound on what T1 can be. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Okay. So let, let's suppose it, it's on the order of 10 to the minus one times the square root of n. Uh, or actually it's squared, so the uh, n. So it's small for you know reasonable implementations of the of the code. I agree. Um, so fine. So then we have this, which is actually quite nice because we have we already have done have done the calculation to get g1 at the up and down nodes. So we don't have to do anything else now to get delta except take the difference and divide by um, two times the square root of uh, delta v, which looks a lot like a finite difference when I. When I first wrote this down, I kind of thought the universe was playing a joke on me. This is just the centered finite difference around delta V. But the, the, the crucial point is the G1 is at the time step in the future. So this is not a finite, uh, finite difference delta. Um, the other thing is it doesn't have any, well, modulo what we just talked about, it doesn't have any extra approximation. So what I mean is when you do a finite del difference delta, you have an H, a bump H, and you get an error in the delta that's proportional to something like H squared or H that's not in the price. But in this formula, the only, well, there's two sources of, of, of error. One is from the price and two is from the um, gauss my quadrature. So on, on the binomial tree, the whole way you've been doing the gauss my quadrature. So you, you're gonna get a delta that is the same error of approximation as the price which I think is uh, quite, quite remarkable at no computational cost because you've already done all the computation to get G1 at the times you need, at the, at the stock uh, prices you need it. So you can, you can insert a single line of code to existing implementations to get this delta. And so to demonstrate this, I, I did it on Julia. You might ask, why would I use a niche programming language like Julia? First of all, it's very nice. Uh, second of all, there's a paper on Wilmot that uh, showed doing a, a Julia implementation of the tree in Monte Carlo and using their dual numbers, which are almost primitive types uh, that carry around all the information for automatic differenti differentiation. And in it, they said, you can't get a gamma on the tree. So that was the inspiration for the second paper to talk about how I can get gamma on the tree. But let's look at some uh, results for Delta. Well, first can of I, all- I can, I just, can I just stop you a sec? Yeah. Like if, you go, if you go back to the CRR paper mm -hmm. and you know try and look at, and see what they call delta, okay, which is like, they obviously have a binomial model and for them, delta is the number of shares you hold to hedge a call, you know, if you're doing a call um, in that binomial model. And um, you'll see that they actually 
find that the number of shares to hold to hedge the call is the um, right hand side that you have here, except they don't have the one minus business that you know that you have there. Which we, you know, so but one of my main point is that they're actually calculating. Let me be precise: a, a finite difference, not at quote time zero, but at time one. Okay, so. So they're 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 bumping in space at time one as opposed to time zero, just as you are here. Well, that's interesting. Is that clear? Yeah. Go take a look. You'll see yeah. that's exactly what the delta is in the model. Okay. Okay. So I put that on a fundamental ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah, that is really interesting. No one really talks about that, right? I've never seen that talked about. Uh, well, when I teach the binomial model, I, I make this point. Um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm positive that fact. You just, just go check it. OK, so anyway. Peter, so just Leon. They didn't say. Sorry, go ahead, Leon. Uh, P uh, Peter, sorry yeah. to interrupt, General. Peter, just, I mean, speaking, ahead, very na speaking very naively, doesn't that violate that you're trying to calculate a partial derivative in the state variable direction only. I mean, with the delta, by moving forward one unit in time. I'm just again speaking very, very stupidly. What you just said. Well, you know, there's a partial derivative means you're holding something constant while you change another thing, but it doesn't say where you're holding. Right. Other, okay. You know, so, <laughs> That's true. So, you're holding, so you know, once you're once P, P one constant. Okay, go ahead. One one thing that I've I've through this research found is uh, Malavil Malavillian calculus, and you have the sense of a directional mm -hmm. derivative there, and I think this is linked to that somehow. I haven't made the leap, uh, the the haven't made the that clear yet okay. how it's connected. Yeah, but I think I mean I the likelihood ratio point. idea and Malavillian calculus are intimately related. <laughs> I would say they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so I agree with the, that connection. Uh, and, um, but you know, what hasn't been made as a point, as far as I know, is the point you just made about the order of error of the, you know, if you're thinking of the right. binomial model as a, as an approximation of, of the continuous model, then your point you just made about the order of the error being the same for Delta and the value is not a point I've seen. And so that's an important point. Right, and I think when I first gave the talk, that's what you mentioned too, as the important aspect of this uh, this research. Um, so we can just go ahead and okay. and and uh, look at what the delta is, and due to the discrete nature, all the AD or bumping is going to give you this uh, step function delta, whereas the likelihood ratio method gives you the nice continuous one on a tree. Um, and this is a gamma. I, I don't. I moved gamma around in the talk, so it shouldn't be here, but. This is what the point, Peter, you just made, like the yellow and blue lines are the relative error in price and delta, and they're the same order. If you zoom in around the strike, the mm -hmm. delta is actually smaller, but I, that's not a general feature. Okay. Um, and even for American options, you can get uh, the likelihood ratio method, um, and it looks really nice. So that means, I think, if people are using bump or automatic differentiation to, to hedge uh, American options on trees, you could get mishedge almost a lot of the time, whereas the likelihood ratio method is going to give you much better properties of, of the deltas. Um, it's even true for European digital, um, but the, now you are going to get the likelihood ratio method is going to give you the stepwise um, uh, behavior. And then the digital put relative error, it's, it's quite large, but digital puts on trees are notorious um, for, for their Greeks. <laughs> So then, mm -hmm. so I think this is the point in the paper um, on Wilmot that I followed. Uh, they said that you can't calculate gamma and it's due to essentially the interaction of the- um, is, But when, when he tells what you, what's meant by gamma in this, because oh, there's a number of possible for gamma in this oh. context. Um, gamma is the derivative of delta with respect to uh, input, uh, sorry, uh, stock price. So it's the second derivative of the price with respect to the stock price. So a derivative is to be distinguished from a finite difference. And 
is the goal to get a derivative uh, on a tree? Yeah, because if we look at even, even the European call, the AD um, and the bumped delta is going to be piecewise constant. You don't get gamma uh, on a tree. You cannot calculate gamma on a tree. Well, let's say if you tried, you get zero infinity. Is that the point? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. For, it's a little bit better for uh, American because you get some of the rounding, but uh, it's still it, it, nonsensical, let's say. So um, yeah. it basically- it, That's actually, can I stop you a sec? Um, yeah. I mean, the derivative of that piecewise function that we just looked at is not what I would call gamma. I mean, um, like, so, um, I mean, let's say, um, I mean, it would be, you know, if I had to do it, I could get a good, a reasonable approximation for gamma on a binomial tree, but going out two periods, then there's three nodes and, right. you know, doing the, the difference of deltas, right? So, so why is it, you know, so, and that thing I just calculated, I agree is, let's say, not the, literally the second derivative of the current price with respect to the current underlying. It's not, uh, it's merely an approximation to that thing. So, so is, you know, is the only point being made here, I'm just asking, is that the, you know, um, you cannot calculate a continuous concept like a second derivative uh, on a lattice. Is that the only point being made here? Or are they also saying like approximations are impossible or what, are, what is being said here? I don't know. Because it's obvious that on a lattice, you can't get, you know, a, a derivative, okay, a second derivative. I mean, that to me is like trivial as a statement right. because, you know, you don't, the meaning of a derivative involves an infinitesimal and there's no infinitesimals on a lattice. So, so is that the only point being made here or is there another point being made here? Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's, that's the crucial point of being made. Um, the, the deltas I get are, are better than what you'd, like, you're right, there's no epsilon on a, on a lattice. Right. But, but this LRM technique, which you pointed out was in the original CRR, um, gives you the, a very good approximation to the delta, the same approximation to the price, even though there's no epsilons, because the epsilon went away when I did the hand by hand derivative of the Green's function. Like, I don't have an epsilon in my derivative definition anymore. Right, I did the limit as epsilon goes to zero already. Yeah, but even your delta, which is admittedly accurate, is not the first derivative of the option price uh, with respect to the underlying stock price. It's a good approximation of it, right? So, so even for delta, it cannot be calculated on a binomial tree because um, there is no infinitesimals. Even your approach is not literally delta as the first derivative. It's merely a good approximation right. to that first derivative. But it's as much insofar as the price is given by the Gauss two-step Gauss Fermat quadrature. The delta is given by the two-step or any second order guess from my quadrature, right? Like, yes, obviously so, so, I didn't do so the infinite the delta in black shoals. No, the delta, in, like the delta in a binomial model, yes, and the delta in the black shoals, no. So that's why I'm asking for precise definitions here. Well, so, I mean, if you go back to where is it? Uh, here, if I did this integral like with the black shoals greens function here yeah. and this is like max that, of x function. Is, go ahead. That's I, would, the delta. I would get the delta yeah yes that's true so, so, so you're absolutely but i think that's the point you're right it's not the literal delta but yeah, I mean, so far as the approximation point. of the price you get the approximation no, of the delta be, i mean you really shouldn't be putting an equal sign in the second bullet point right but you moved away from it but quick back okay here yeah yeah the, <laughs> okay. I mean, that's my point, though. So, you know, I mean, you really have to say plus order of error, whatever, even though we put an equal sign there. Yeah. Okay. So here's right? my paper. Here's my paper. Okay, yes. <laughs> it's an approximate okay, approximate. in my paper. <laughs> so. so that's my all right. <laughs> so to get consistent between your slides and your paper, you should put an approx in the slides. <laughs> Fair, fair yeah. point. Um, but so let's look at, well, I don't know if we want need to look at gamma. So gamma, 
Um, and you can do it for Vanna as well, which obviously is important for FX. Um, and you see it's not continuous totally, or sorry, it's not differentiable, but it's, it's, it's looks like what gamma should look like for an American put. Um, but I guess quickly, I, I'm sort of actually over time, aren't I? No. <laughs> no, you have until uh, 1030. Oh, okay. <laughs> Some reason I thought it was All right. So, so let's talk about Monte Carlo. And you might ask, well, why do you need to do anything with Monte Carlo? Likelihood ratio method came from Monte Carlo. But just like we were talking about um, not having any approximation of epsilon, epsilon in Monte Carlo, um, or H, I call it, d destroys the stability of the Greek, right? As soon as you have a finite delta uh, uh, Monte Carlo, you, do, you try and decrease the H to get a better approximation. You actually increase the variance of your sample. So it's really, you don't really have a, a finite difference Greek in Monte Carlo. But what if you did this? At time T1, you did a Monte Carlo simulation. At time, at, at the upstate and the downstate, you need for the likelihood ratio method and took the, the, the formula that I, that I showed. Now, this picture reminded me of the Tesla image when he's sitting in his room with the electricity. So that's why I put that there. Um, but basically, I'm trying to like motivate that you can get a finite, um, sorry, a stable bumped Monte Carlo Greek delta by, by doing this method. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I, I show, this is the European call. The, just like we claimed, the air and the delta is equal to the air and price as we move up in, uh, in N, a uh, number of Monte Carlo paths. And on the left, I show, least, sorry, on the right, I show least squared Monte Carlo, American Monte Carlo. And this is preliminary research. So I'm only showing the convergence is the same. That is the difference between the result uh, in successive increases of Ns. And they, it, they look to be converging at the same rate. Now they're not converging to the right number. So that's why I haven't showed more results, but this does look promising that we can get uh, least squared American Monte Carlo having a, like a stable and as accurate as the price delta using this approach. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, what about partial differential equations? Can we use this technique on partial differential equations? So in order to get your delta through this approach on a grid, you need to have the values. Um, you need those values to exist basically on the grid. So you can do a number of methods. If the grid is evenly spaced, you can change the grid spacing to make sure that the, the, what you, the points you need are on the grid. You could just move the nodes so that the, um, that's an uneven grid, but that's not that, that, bad a deal, that big a deal. Or you could do a cubic spline type interpolation to get the, where you need them. Um, or the, my preferred approach is ghost nodes. And so I'll talk a little bit about what ghost nodes are if people aren't that familiar with PDEs. But if you put ghost nodes where you need them, um, then you can get them for every, uh, for you only need to do it for the central node, i.e. The, the central node that represents the stock price today. So what is a ghost node? So in finance, we don't have boundary conditions like in physics where we fix the rope and see the vibrational mode or we you know, put a, a taut drum on a, on a fix the, the, the boundary. Uh, we really have free boundary conditions. And so on a grid, we need to somehow uh, use that. And a lot of people use the far field approximation, say the second derivative is zero, but we need in that case to make sure we're far enough away from where those effects will be important. So that actually gives you, um, you know, computational burden to know that you're far enough away. Another approach is to use the equation itself to determine the boundary conditions, i.e. make sure it is this free boundary condition um, and use ghost nodes. So what a ghost node is, it's a node that doesn't actually live on the grid, but you, um, but you carry along all the information and then do the propagation of it. And the, the edge nodes depend on that ghost node. And what you do is you flip around the derivatives. So those are all either all forward or all backward. So all of the information of the propagation of these ghost nodes are on the grid. And uh, in that way, you can, um, you can have the boundary conditions. You don't have to impose like the second derivative of zero. The equation itself gives you the boundary conditions. I mean, the Black-Scholes equation of that PDE. Um, and you need as many, if you want uh, order of x delta x squared, you need as many ghost nodes as orders you want in order to preserve the tridiagonal properties of the matrices. Um, so that's what ghost nodes are. It's not really the point of the talk. I just wanted to motivate them before we talk about putting them in where the likelihood ratio method points are. So we put those, we put the 
LRM, um, we determine where the LRM points are, likelihood ratio method upstate and downstate. We put those as ghost nodes. And basically we, we, can, we calculate their propagation by a, a non um, equidistant grid. That's fine. The equations are just a bit different. Um, and then we have two of the, we have the nodes that we need to calculate the delta. I, and as I said before, alternatively, we could just like snap the closest node to that. Um, that makes a non-equidistant grid, which is just a bit more work, but it's it's fine. Or we could, um, yeah, change the whole grid spacing so that those line up exactly. But I I've only done the one implementation of the ghost nodes. And as we find, so what I'm, I've done here is. Back, a, a, um, I just want to yeah. go back, please. Um, so are the circles here, the ghost nodes? The, the, the non-filled in circles. The, 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 the gray, filled in circles. The filled in circles okay. are, the, are the nodes, are the grid. And the non-filled in circles are the ghost nodes. Yeah, OK. Um, so um, like, why are you, let's say, using the non-filled in circles, it looks like on this slide? So remember, we need um, the position of the stock in the upstate to be a very precise position, right? It needs to be the square root of V, right? Oh, OK. So that's not going to appear on the grid unless you construct your grid specifically to have them on there. And you can do that either by changing the grid spacing to, be, to, to have that in there by construction move the nearest grid to be the LRM, LRM up and down state, and that produces a non-equidistant grid, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you can do the ghost node. Uh, that's the implementation I've chosen. That's all. OK. And um, like from the picture, the, the probabilities you're going to use are a half. Um, and that's, that's also true when you implement this. Is that right? Well, if you put the ghost node on the e to the r minus one half v plus or minus square root of v, mm -hmm. you, use, you use one half. Yes. OK. So shifted Gauss Hermite quadrature, when you shift the nodes, you shift both the nodes. And there's a corresponding shift of the weights. And that's how you get this like uh, CRR one half p. Um, I forget what it is, but it basically it's like one half minus r plus one half v over square root of v, something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to get the right answer, for guess how my quadrature, when you shift the nodes, you have to shift the weights. So if you were going to use just the square root of V and not the R minus one half plus or minus square root of V, you'd need different um, weights here. And they'd be the CRR weights. Yeah, so the CRR weights in my mind flawed <laughs> because they can actually go outside the interval zero one. Whereas your approach with these ghost nodes, I think keeps the probabilities inside zero one. In fact, at a half. At a half, <laughs> okay. yeah. Is, it, is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the advantage I'm saying of your ghost node approach over not using ghost nodes is that you, you know, can ensure that the probabilities are between zero and one. So the results, CR do not, you know, CR would not use. Okay. So the results, I do a scan over the sigma, the volatility, a scan over the strike, um, and the green is the price uh, relative error. And the blue and the red are two different ways of getting delta. One is my LRM approach with the ghost nodes, and the blue is just off the grid. So if you do a fully explicit PD approach, you have all of the all of the stock prices at T. You just you don't just have the um, initial. Sorry, you have all of the stock prices at at the at today. You don't just have the one uh, initial stock price. So that means what I'm trying to say is that means you you have enough information to calculate basically a finite difference uh, delta. And so when I did that, it was the same error as the LRM. So I don't know if we've gained a lot here uh, <laughs> uh, over traditional techniques. So one thing I'm thinking about, though, is since we have a closed form solution for the delta, is there any way we can set that equal to 1 and look for the American uh, exercise boundary? Is there, is there some way of using this? insight to uh to further our understanding of the american exercise boundary or if we put if we put um if we can calculate delta everywhere on the grid so make the grid spacing such that um you have all the deltas can we look in the grid where the delta equals one and call that the exercise boundary i don't know those are ideas i haven't quantified or written down yet i'm just thinking out loud here okay
Um, so those are the three approaches, uh, binomial tree, Monte Carlo, and PDE. Um, so I've gone through what the likelihood ratio method is. Um, I've talked about how it's very efficient on a binomial tree. Um, and I, I guess I would add a bit more color now, Peter, to the story that even though it was written down by CRR in the 70s, I don't think it was appreciated that the accuracy was, was, so, was so hard. Yes, I agree with that, yeah. Um, and then mm -hmm. I've, I've used the concept and tried to think about how I can apply this to Monte Carlo or PDE. And I think I have some ideas there. I don't think I have the full story yet um, on, uh, I think American Monte Carlo, a finite, uh, a good Delta is probably a, a, an important thing. Um, and then again, this research is all stemmed from the, the evergreen trees where I, I re-derived the binomial and trinomial tree using a Green's function approach as opposed to a fully explicit, fully explicit finite difference um, approach. And that's going to be published uh, fall of this year. And that uh, the, the paper I've submitted to Risk Magazine is in the SSRN um, link there. And I just have the uh, some references. Um, and I think these slides are going to be shared with everyone. So um, you're able to read the references. So I'm happy to answer any more further questions. Um, I know a lot was talked about during the talk, but I'm sure people have more questions. Well, I have a comment. Um, so I, I guess I understand the motivation for the name evergreen trees. You're capturing greens functions in trees. And um, so um, I noticed that, well, in your talk, the um, interest rate little r was just a function of time, but nothing, um, let's say, in the computational finance prevents r from depending, on the computational side at least, of finance depends, prevents r from depending on the spatial variable x. And let's say, if, you know, I can imagine, I mean, if r is literally the interest rate, there are even finance reasons where that could be true, like if x were, say, S&P 500, you could imagine that its level somehow affects the interest rate, even if you know the Black Scholes model says no, it doesn't. Um, so, um, so you know, so that's something you could do. Is all I'm saying, and not depart at all from using Green's functions. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing um, actually, one future avenue of research is based on a paper you wrote in 1998, Peter. Um, uh, variance gamma. So you have a closed form solution for an option price when it's a subordinated process. And the subordinated process is a gamma process and you can integrate out that exactly and get a different uh, PD, uh, transition density function. So I'm thinking we can use that tr transition function to rederive a binomial tree for that context because you're not going to get the same tree because you don't have the um, essentially Gaussian function, you have some other fat tailed function. Mm -hmm. But as long as, as, lo as long as we can start to make out the, the special polynomials associated with that function, either if we know them or through some Gram-Schmidt procedure, we can make a tree. And then on that tree, we can price American options in a fat tailed distribution, which I think would be interesting. Okay, um, before you go too far down that road, <laughs> I think Brendan Schwartz the pretty much already did this. Um, so you could, they have a, an old JFQA paper where they call, which they called um, explicit and implicit finite differences of synthesis or something like that. Uh, and um, they, you know, so I'm sure you appreciate that the explicit finite difference method is, is a, is a trinomial tree. And um, what they also point out is that the implicit finite difference method is a jump process. And uh, it turns out to be <laughs> pretty much the variance gamma jump process. <laughs> okay, uh, the, not that they knew that when they did that back then. Hmm. But anyway. Um, I don't know that paper. So there, you can send it to me. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. sure, sure. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, I certainly like, you know, so, um, you know, variance gamma is, as you know, a continuous time, continuous state space, pure jump process. And, um, um, but let's say a main, you know, one way of looking at it is that um, there is a future time at which the distribution is Laplace. Um, so a difference of two exponentially distributed random variables. And, um, and, um, well, 
so um, <clears throat> you know, so if you were to now discretize space at that particular time point, I mean, you would end up getting an implicit finite difference scheme, it turns out. Um, so that's the connection I'm specifically thinking about. Um, the, uh, you know, the classical Euler implicit, fully backward implicit scheme. Okay, anyway. Um, so, um, so, so, but let's say, um, I guess like the main takeaway, right? Like um, when you have at the bottom of your slide, see the advantage. <laughs> the, the main advantage of your approach is the accuracy of delta for sure. And then for gamma, I'm less clear. It, do you, what's the claim on the approximation for gamma? Is it, is it better somehow when you use this likelihood approach? Um, or is it just that you're saying you can calculate? Because I, I actually thought it was obvious how to calculate it before I saw your paper. <laughs> um, but is it, I mean, is it more accurate? Is that for gamma? Well, so I was really responding to this paper. Hopefully it'll come up. Um, and maybe this is the best paper. But they uh, basically say, I'll show you the quote that after I had my evergreen, okay. um, they, okay. they, show the, the, they show the gammas um, doesn't work here. They say a possible solution to this case is to use the likelihood ratio method, although the approach is usually applied. Unfortunately, this can't be automated easily since it requires knowledge of the approximating. However, once the LR delta is computed, we can use AD to compute the gamma. So this is basically what I did. I was like, oh, I, I, I've solved that problem and I can automate the likelihood ratio method. And yes, I can. I, um, add automatic differentiation. So this is really the paragraph I was responding to when I wrote that paper, likely gamma. Right, but in this paper, they, they, they simply have that phrase, since it requires knowledge of the underlying continuous model, like, I mean, I feel like you're starting from, you know, the underlying continuous model. So totally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, they're saying they're thinking differently. I, I would imagine because they're thinking you don't know the underlying continuous well, model. Well, yeah, I, I think their error is like once you write down the binomial tree, you've already chosen a model. It's not like you're model agnostic. That's very tied to a log normal model, right? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, so I could imagine using a binomial model to approximate a non non you know, not a geometric Brownian motion could be, it could be any diffusion, I would imagine. Every diffusion could be approximated with a binomial model. Well, right? you need to calculate the weights and nodes, right? Yes. Like those, so those, the weight. The... <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I... say I pick uh, CEV as a non geometric Brownian motion. <laughs> like, I couldn't um, definitely come up with a binomial model that approximates the CEV dynamics. Do you agree? And I guess I have to calculate nodes and weights. I grant that, <laughs> but why can't I do that? Well, how, how would you do that? The Graham Schwartz, Graham Schmidt orthogonalization? Okay. So I happen to pick, <laughs> I happen to pick a very friendly model for what I'm trying to do, which, <laughs> so the density in CEV is known in closed form. <laughs> and uh, so the Green's function is known in closed form. So I just have to discretize the Green's function. And um, so um, why is that, you know, so I use finite differences, let's say. I mean, it, it you know, so, um, the, right? There's, so there's a PD that the Greek, that the density solves called the Kolmogorov forward equation. And, uh, Oh, I see. Also a backward equation. Okay. And yeah, so yeah. now approximate. So I think I think what you're saying is you just do the explicit finite difference on the PE. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's correct. But and let's say and impose a constraint so it's not trinomial but binomial, since that seems to be the goal. Right. I think using so this is this is one thing I think there's actually a difference between my point of view on the Green's function versus a, an explicit finite difference. In the explicit finite difference. The coefficients are the drift and the and the variance, but 
they're they're the approximation like that they're the sigma squared of t whereas in the when you do the green's function approach you get the whole integrated variance the actual variance between the two time steps not some um approximation to that integral do you know what i mean um i think you're trying to distinguish global versus local is that true like so a p let's say a pd is a local thing and a greens function is a global thing is that the point you're i mean so right sorry right. so if you look at even the the whole white paper they say we're going to have exact exactly the mean and exactly the variance between the two time steps but in a pd you never get exactly the mean exactly the, you get this local um, mu of x as opposed to the integral of mu of x between the two nodes mm -hmm. so okay. i think that's so i think i think that's what made me think that i don't believe it's an explicit finite difference it's actually a greens function because these total variants show up not the instantaneous variances so what i'm trying to say to you is yes you'll get an approximation for bone animal tree but i don't think it's going to be as um, robust as as when you have the total variances between them as a, as a more global approach. Yeah. So, um, all right. But is it fair to say that your approach needs an explicit formula for a Green's function? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So oh, what I want. <laughs> those are rare. I mean, you have one. Yeah, those are rare. Those are rare. You're totally right. <laughs> but but like student T, we have it. But the problem I'm, I'm I've been working out with student T recently, and the problem with student T is it only has n finite moments, right? And so I need to recreate Gauss from Gauss quadrature using the student T distribution, but the properties of Gauss quadrature depend on all these moments being finite because you have all these orthogonal polynomials. So I'm trying to see if it breaks down at some end, do I still get the nice integral quadrature properties of the Gauss quadrature? Okay. Okay. So I can certainly see your the value in having like, I think what you're basically, your, your approach could be described as this. Um, we, you're starting from models where there is an ex, a Green's function explicitly. And, yeah. um, and then let's say, if all we had to do is value the European option, then we're done since we have the Green's function already. But you're really trying to value, let's say an American option possibly. Right. And um, so you wanna take advantage of the fact that you have a Green's function to value an American option more act and get its Greeks more accurately than if you just used um, finite differences on the PDE that values an American option. Is, is that an accurate statement? Yes, yeah, I, I like that way of looking at it. I have been thinking about if I don't have an explicit expression, but I have the PDE, could I get a numerical Green's function? And could I do some sort of numerical Gram-Schmidt orth orthogonalization to, to get numerically, you know, this, this Gauss and quadrature method. I haven't done that yet, but I, I've had that thought. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I'd say you definitely can get a numerical Green's function. So it wouldn't, you know, it would be an approximation of the mm -hmm. Green's function in the continuous model, but, you know, put a one <laughs> as your payoff at one node and zero at all the others, and yeah, yeah. you will get um, the numerical Green's function when you solve the PDE. So um, you can definitely do that. <clears throat> okay. Um, it's, it's almost 1030. So we have like a couple minutes. Does anybody else want to chime in? Uh, Tom, right. I'll just- um, Well, uh, thank Tom. you all then for attending. Well, uh, Leon, Leon has a question. Oh, Peter, well, Tom, just going back to the beginning, like your starting off point, if I go in the pure Black-Scholes framework and I do a binomial tree to price the option, and I also I use that same tree, same refinement to get the Delta. So really at the beginning of your entire concept here, right, mm -hmm. as I reduce the time step width in this, in this old Black-Scholes, in the um, standard binomial approach to obtain the Black-Scholes formula, mm -hmm. how much worse is is the convergence of the true de of the delta, uh, discrete delta to the true delta? How much worse is that as I s narrow the time steps than than the convergence of the price? You probably mentioned this in your in your talk more than once, but what is the conventional view of how much worse the improvement of the delta calculation is as you refine the binomial tree 
in the standard, you know, going back 1970s era, binomial approximation of the Black Scholes formula. I'm just curious. Well, so I, I think from my lens, from my point of view, it's the same. Um, because you're in, you have a continuous integral to approximate and you do it by two to the n, um, no, two n, sorry, two n steps where n is the number of nodes, right. or time, time steps, yeah. um, you, get, you get a convergence to the price for, so delta equal to the convergence of the price because you're not approximating the delta in any other in it you don't add like another h or anything so in this is what i think peter and i were, were discussing at the start in the in this yeah. framework in this framework the convergence of price and delta is the same it's not any different yeah and that's because simply the, the view of delta is as a price of the right claim okay so so what you know the main thing Tom because, is saying, yeah, yeah. to take away is that right, right. So, calculating delta as calculating a price. Okay, so in the Black-Scholes model that you can definitely do that. So for example, if it was a call, we wanted to call delta, you would say it's just the price of a binary payoff paying right. one if stock is above strike and, or it's actually, it turns out, sorry, I take that back. It's actually, you get, it's a gap call. You So, so the value of a, the delta in the Black-Scholes model is the value of a payoff, which is the stock price of the stock price above strike divided by S0, actually. Stock price divided by S0 times, you know, if the stock price above strike and zero otherwise. So that gap payoff, okay, is, you know, if you just price that gap payoff, you get the delta of a call in the Black-Scholes model. And so the point Tom's making is that, therefore, the accuracy when you now do things numerically for you know the call delta is the same as the accuracy of the call premium itself okay which is not the usual story just in the background right. here tom and i both know uh, that we usually when you just do the the classical bump you actually lose an order of accuracy um so if you were not taking advantage of green's functions being present and so on then when you just bump your 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 delta is one order less accurate than right. your premium. But but, okay. Peter, but what but what if let's say you're in a non-GBM and you have a discrete approximation of the Green's function? Would that still prevail? That the accuracy is about this would be the same for the delta and the price. Let's say you had to discretize. You couldn't solve the fo forward equation to get you know explicit form for the density. It would still be true that if you had took a numerical approximation. For the you know the probability density, you would still not it wouldn't be any worse for the delta than it would be than it is for the for the derivative for the derivative price itself. I think that comes back to the discussion we had at the end of the talk, Peter. Yeah, I guess we don't we don't know. We I mean, don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. we'd have to look at exactly how you discretize the Green's function. The, the, the density, right? I want I want to try that. For sure. See the area introduced there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. you could always okay. do, if you have the PD, um, you could always do the explicit finite difference to get some sort of tree. But what I'm trying to say is yeah. maybe I can go further and get uh, uh, a Gaussian quadrature for that distribution. I, I don't yeah. know yet. So I want to try that. Tom, I try that. Yeah. So, Tom, there's a word you should write down. It's called parametrics. So, P A R A M E T R I X. And that is like a numerical approach for getting Green's functions from a PD. Okay. Okay, that's where I would start. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. So we'll see you next week. Th thanks in particular, Tom. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Tom. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me. You can stop the recording. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. bye.